Hello class, this lecture is going to discuss the pre-analytic variables and specimen collection. Okay, so right before we bring our patients to the laboratory for an examination, we have to take note that there are factors that can affect or uh, it will influence the laboratory results. So according to Haverstick, we have the diurnal variation, exercise, fasting, diet, ethanol consumption, we have tobacco smoking, drug ingestion, and posture. So let's start with diurnal variation. So diurnal variation would refer to the variation that would manifest in the levels of substances uh, based on the different time intervals. So some of the substances can have higher values in the morning. Other substances would have higher values in the evening. Let's take this tabulation. Okay, so cortisol is noted to have a peak level in the morning, that's around 4 to 6 a.m. And its lower le lowest level would be at 8 p.m. to 12 a.m. And the difference between the two levels would be around 50%. In addition to cortisol, there's ACTH, renin, aldosterone, and insulin. These are substances that would be noted to have lower levels at night time. On the other hand, we have some substances that would be higher in the afternoon and evening, which would be the growth hormone and acid phosphatase. Prolactin is noted to have peak, two peak levels that's located in the morning at 4 and 8 a.m. and in the evening at 8 and 10 p.m. Iron, which would be found in hemoglobin, is noted to have uh, peak levels early to late morning. And take note, uh, it decreases up to 30% during the day. So uh, next factor is exercise. So when our patients before coming to the lab, would go for a jogging or for a marathon, we have to take note that exercise can affect the following. So we have the creatine phosphokinase or the CK. We have the amino transferases like the AST and ALT or aspartate amino transferase and alanine amino transferase. And then we have the lactate dehydrogenase. So, uh, these substances would, uh, would be based on metabolic activities. Like if they had gone from an exercise, the AST and ALT levels would be higher than normal by as much as 180%. And LDH would be higher by around 300% from the normal. Okay? So, but take note, that uh, these elevations can revert back to pre-exercise levels. The exercise would also be associated with activation of coagulation, fibrinolysis, and platelets. And if our patients uh, exercise regularly with chronic aerobic exercise, they are noted to have lower plasma concentration of of CK, of creatine kinase, AST, ALT, and LD. So again, when you have chronic aerobic exercise, it is noted to have lower, lower baseline values for AST, ALT, LD, and CK. Okay. Next, we have fasting. So fasting is an important okay, procedure uh, for the following substances. We have glucose, triglycerides, cholesterol, and electrolytes. So when we are measuring these substances, we have to measure them in their basal states. So triglycerides and cholesterol would require a 12-hour fasting period because we need to clear out the chylomicrons, and we need around 6 to 9 hours. For glucose, it's a uh, fasting uh, recommendation would be around 8 to 14 hours. 
What if our patients would fast excessively? So around 48 hours. And uh, according to Henry's, it would increase bilirubin instead of decreasing it. And for men, it can uh, increase the triglycerides, glycerol, free fatty acids. For females or women, it tends to decrease plasma glucose levels to hypoglycemic values at around 45 milligrams per deciliter. Okay. So next, we go to the diet. Okay. So for diet, if our patients uh, would love to eat uh, meat, then they have higher levels of blood urea nitrogen, blood uric acid, and ammonia. If they are vegans or vegetarians, they tend to have lower levels of uh, those present in lipid profile, like the low-density lipoprotein, very low-density lipoprotein. They have the triglycerides and cholesterol. But they're noted to have vitamin B12 deficiency. Okay. A high unsaturated to saturated fat ratio is noted to have decreased serum cholesterol. So if our patients uh, love to go to McDonald's, uh, that's where we have a lot of saturated fat, like French fries. And then if our uh, patients would favor uh, not having dairy products, uh, like they want more of the fish and more of the, uh, of the seed oils, then that's the unsaturated type. Okay. So for our obese patients or obese individuals, they're noted to have increased levels of LDH, cortisol, and glucose. And according to Young, in their study, there's testosterone reduction for obese men. Okay. With regards to alcohol ingestion, it tends to increase the lactate dehydrogenase blood urea nitrogen, blood uric acid, and triglyceride. The effect of chronic alcoholism tends to increase HDL, which is good for the heart, okay? but it affects the liver function uh, with higher values of gamma glutamyl transferase. And then in the uh, blood picture, we have increased mean corpuscular volume. For tobacco smoking, it can increase carboxyhemoglobin, cortisol, and catecholamines. The chronic effects, uh, the, the effects for chronic tobacco smoking would be increased hemoglobin, RBC counts, mean corpuscular volume, and WBC count. Tobacco smoking also tends to decrease the immune response. We decrease IgA, Ig, IgG, and IgM, and increase IgE. Uh, in one study, it's noted to cause a decrease in the sperm count, motility, and increase abnormal morphology. For drugs, uh, we take note that antibiotics, anesthetics, and effect function tests. So as much as possible, if they are taking in antibiotics or anesthetics, they have to... Uh, postpone their laboratory testing. Uh, for posture, uh, like for example, our patients uh, wake up in the morning, uh, they, they would have a supine to standing position or going for an upright position, which tends to uh, decrease the plasma volume and increase proteins and calcium. And this will lead to, le uh, to effects of hemoconcentration. So as much as possible, we have to tell or instruct our patients not to immediately go to the lab because of this condition. Okay, so they have to wait for a while, around one hour. And then tourniquet application, prolonged tourniquet application can cause hemoconcentration. Stress can also uh, cause increase of some substances like ACTH, cortisol, and catecholamine. Okay, so now you know the different factors. So when you are going to instruct our patients, okay, 
uh, to go to the laboratory, you have to include certain instructions. So they should refrain uh, within 24 hours from doing any stressful activity, take in alcohol or smoke, uh, take in drugs, okay, uh, antibiotics or any changes in diet. And patients should rise up one hour before specimen collection in order to remove the variability of the posture. So now we go to the specimen collection. So we have the general specimen requirements like uh, the bringing of appropriate containers for urine and stool, which would be presented with a request slip that has similar labels as that of the container, which is the patient's name, the date and time of collection, as well as the ID number if it is available. For blood, there are uh, three forms of blood collection. So number one would be the venipuncture, number two would be arterial puncture, and number three would be skin puncture. So they have different uh, the different reasons why we perform this uh, these forms of collection. Venipuncture is the most common form. Uh, arterial puncture is used for blood gas analysis. Skin puncture is if we have difficulty in performing venipuncture. Uh, there are uh, a lot of collection tube colors available at Henry's, but the ones I've tabulated are the most commonly used, okay? So kindly remember the color as well as the anticoagulant that would be uh, specific for the color tube. The red doesn't have any anticoagulant and uh, it is used to collect for serum. So it's the one or the tube that is used for chemistry uh, and uh, immunology. Lavender is, uh, is the one that contains the ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid or EDTA. And there are two preparations. We have the K3 and the K2. The K3 is located in the glass and it is in liquid form. The K2 is found in plastic tubes and it is the dried form. So this is the type of anticoagulant that is used for hematology, for cell morphology. The green tube, on the other hand, would contain heparin. And this is the excellent anticoagulant of choice for potassium determination. However, it's not used for hematologic uh, testing or coagulation testing okay, because it can interfere with immunoassays. Uh, blue and the black, they both have the same anticoagulants, that's the sodium citrate, but they are prepared in different ratio. So the blue is prepared in a 9 is to 1 ratio, where in the 9 refers to the blood and 1 refers to the anticoagulant. The black is prepared in a 4 is to 1 ratio. What is the use of the blue? It is used for coagulation studies because it preserves the labile factors. The black is used for, uh, for hematology, specifically for ESR, the erythrocyte sedimentation rate with the Westergren method. The gray contains sodium chloride, which is a glycolytic inhibitor. Uh, it inhibits glycolysis for three days. Yellow contains citrate dextrose, which uh, is used for blood banking for paternity testing. Okay. So these are the three most commonly used tubes. The red tube, the lavender tube, and the blue tube. So take note that the, uh, the anticoagulated tubes would have this line which would signify that that would be the limit for the amount of blood to be collected, okay? And these are what we call as microtainers. So 
they are used to collect blood from infants. Okay? Because if we're going to collect it with these tubes, uh, we can induce anemia. So this would be the lavender tube. We call them as microtainers. So the lavender tube would have the lines over here. It means that we are going to uh, get blood up to this portion only. Okay. So these are the different effects of anticoagulants. Okay. So here we have uh, EDTA causing increase in uh, clotting time. Okay. With PPPPP, we use EDTA and it will decrease calcium and iron. Okay. Citrate. Uh, one thing that uh, it would have would be it preserves labile coagulation factors. For heparin, uh, it increases PTPTP, so it's not used for coagulation studies. For sodium fluoride, it distorts the red cells and white blood cells. Okay. So it is also very important to look into the appearance of blood specimen straw color would pertain to the normal color of the serum. If it's hemolyzed, then take note it is clear red. Clear red. What are the factors? We have trauma, heat exposure, forceful spraying. With regards to icteric specimen, it means that there's hyperbilirubinemia. And um, it would show a brownish yellow. Typemic specimen would show a milky turbid fluid. Um, what are the significance of this? Okay, so this uh, appearances can affect the uh, the testing. Okay, with regards to the spectrophotometry, with regards to the analyzer, for hemolysis, it can falsely increase the levels of blood constituents mainly because of its color. If it's clear red or it's pink, color reactions for spectrophotometry would have a pink color or darker. So the moment that we have hemolysis, it means that it can increase, falsely increase the levels of, substance, of substances. For icteric specimen, this can lead to decreased levels of the total protein and cholesterol if bilirubin levels are more than 430 millimoles per liter or 25 milligrams per liter. Okay? So again, it will decrease the cholesterol and total protein. What about lipemic specimen? For lipemic specimen, it will become turbid or we call it as lipemic if the triglyceride would be more than 400 milligrams per deciliter or 4.6 millimoles per liter. Okay. So let's look at the different appearances of the, of the serum. So this is the normal one. Okay. This is, this is the straw color. This is the icteric one. Take note of the meniscus. It's also brown yellow. Okay, so it means that the bilirubin level here is more than 430 milli millimoles per liter or, four, or, or 25 milligrams per liter. This one is the lipemic, it's turbid. Okay, so it can decrease levels of the amylase, the urea, the urea, even cholesterol. Okay, and this would be identified with more than 400 milligrams per deciliter of triglycerides. And lastly, hemolysis, which can increase the levels of blood constituents. Falsely increase. Okay. So for uh, storage of blood, for serum or plasma, we can freeze it, but for whole blood, uh, we only can refrigerate it. Okay. And we can, uh, we can, test it uh, within two hours from refrigeration. What about for urine? So for urine collection, 
the containers uh, would be clean and dry, wide mouth, and we have pedia or wee bags for infants. So the ideal sample, always remember this, is first morning midstream urine. First morning midstream urine. So this is an example of the wide mouth, clean, dried container that we would use for urine collection. This one is the wee bag or the urine bag that is given for infants and neonates. So with regards to the types of urine collection, we have the random, which is used for routine urinalysis. And then we have the time, which is for 2, 12, and 24 hour collection. So what are the instructions for voided midstream urine? So this is very important, okay? Because sometimes we have uh, poor collections from patients because we did not instruct them on how to properly collect the urine sample. We tend to get a lot of contaminations. So for male, if uncircumcised, uh, uncircumcised they have to retract the foreskin. So if they're circumscri circumcised, they only need to uh, wash with soap and water. For females, they have to sit on the toilet and separate the labia minora. So for both males and females, they have to catch the mid portion okay, and pass the first and the last portion. Okay. So time collection, uh, can uh, we would, uh, we can have this one for those with renal problems. So we record the time and always take note that the first voided urine is discarded. So for example, we have a 24 hour urine collection. The first hour, okay, the first urine, sorry, the first voided urine is discarded, okay? And uh, it starts at 8 a.m. and ends at 8 a.m. the following day. The total volume is recorded and we, we preserve the urine samples through refrigeration. And the entire collection should be submitted the following day with a mixed aliquot for analysis. So when preserving urine specimen, we need to bring it immediately to the laboratory because the composition would start at 30 minutes. So we need to identify for the presence of red blood cells, CAST, and WBC. So they need to be submitted within the allotted time. So if sometimes our patients are coming from a long distance, they can, uh, they can place the urine samples in uh, ice pack containers, okay, as this can prevent uh, or decrease bacterial growth and chemical changes. So chemical preservatives can be used like boric acid and formalin tablets to urine specimens. Uh, what are the urine, uh, special urine collection techniques? We have the bladder catheter, catheterization. Okay. So we use the catheter for, especially for patients who are unable to urinate those with stroke and then we perform suprapubic aspiration for patients who have recurrent UTI. For CSF, we perform lumbar puncture, okay? Uh, med techs are not allowed to perform lumbar puncture. Uh, the lumbar puncture would be performed by, by residents or consultants, and this would be done at the level of L3 to L4 or L, between L4 to L5. The, uh, the, the fluid would be collected and placed in three sterile tubes. The first tube would be for chemical studies for comparison with the serum, that's the glucose and the protein. And then we have the microbiological studies and cell count and differential count. Uh, the normal color of uh, CSF, it's clear and colorless because it's a cellular. If it becomes turbid, it's a sign of infection. If the tubes are originally red 
and becomes progressively clear, then it's a sign of traumatic tap. But if all the tubes, the three tubes are red, constantly red, then it's a sign of interventricular hemorrhage. Okay. So for synovial fluid, uh, this is an asp aspirated from synovial joints. It resembles the egg white and it requires six hours of fasting and we use heparinized uh, or plain tubes. And uh, for pleural, pericardial, and peritoneal fluid, we submit it uh, with three tubes similar to what we perform with CSF analysis. Okay, so the first tube for chemical, second tube for microbiological, and third tube for cyclo. So I will just would like to share to you this tabulation from Henry's. So these are the reasons for specimen rejection in the lab. There's hemolysis or leukemia, as I have discussed to you a while ago, the reasons. We have clots present in an anticoagulated specimen because sometimes there are residents who will really persist that kindly perform uh, this examination even though there's the presence of clots in the anticoagulated specimen. A non-fasting specimen when test requires fasting, improper blood collection tube, short draws, wrong volume, improper transport conditions, okay? Uh, discrepancies between requisition and the specimen label. The requisition refers to the request. Unlabeled or mislabeled specimen like wrong, wrong name and contaminated specimen or leaking container, okay? And then these are the common pre-analytic errors. So um, before, we have the incorrect test order, okay, inadequate patient preparation, misidentification of the patient, that's very important. And then we have the uh, during collection, we have the wrong container, wrong additive, the short draws, okay, prolonged tourniquet time that would lead to hemoconcentration. And then we have the after collection, we have inadequate mixing, mixing and clots, mislabeling of the specimens, and processing errors. Okay, so I hope you had a wonderful time. Hope that you learned a lot. Okay, and I'll see you on the next lecture. Okay, so thank you.